Everybody wants it. Most people cannot clearly define it, but people have been obsessed with it for centuries. We're going to be talking about freedom and free will, and I have a special guest, Matt Sweeney. He's going to be taking a philosophical approach to freedom and free will. I'll be taking the NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming approach. We're gonna see if there's some overlap here. We're gonna see if there's points of disagreement. And overall, you're going to have a much better understanding of freedom and how to get more of it in your life, if it's even possible. Welcome. Thank you very much, man, great to be here. I'm just gonna come right out and ask you the, the big, hard question. Mm -hmm. What is freedom? <laughs> I think there's a simple explanation, and then when you get into the details, that's when it gets a bit more complicated. Um, so, in short, it's, it's the ability to think, speak, act, um, according to what one wants to do. Um, it's closely tied to the concept of free will, um, which you could define as the, uh, the ability to, uh, to act at one's own discretion. So this, this seems simple enough concepts, but for thousands of years, it's caused uh, a lot of debate in philosophy. Um, and it's, it, it's a really active debate, debate right now. Mm. So I was listening to a Daniel Dennett podcast a couple of weeks ago where he said it's, it's probably the most urgent question that we've currently got uh, that we need to answer um, in philosophy because it has a lot of repercussions around moral responsibility, around sort of the criminal justice system, around um, our own place as agents in the world and how we should consider that. So yeah, it's a, it's a complicated topic and um, I've got my own opinions of it. So I think there is free will. Um, you've got other sort of leading uh, thinkers such as Sam Harris that would say it's an illusion. And um, yeah, I mean, I can get into the nuts and bots, okay, the, yeah, the so argument for and against it. Is, it, is it attainable? Because I, I know there's a lot of people, and I know for many years in my life, I didn't feel free. I felt like I had free will, mm -hmm. but I felt like the world around me was limiting me. Like I didn't have enough money. Mm -hmm. Uh, I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do. So how does that all play in? Is freedom really attainable? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll argue the, the counterpoint first. So, so Sam Paris, for instance, would say, no, ultimately you do not have free will. So, um, and, and this is based on a deterministic understanding of the universe. Oh. Um, and science backs determinism. So um, this is essentially the concept that if, you, if, you, if I was to interrogate the individual neurons in your brain, Nothing that the neurons are doing is contravening the laws of physics. They're all acting in very predictable ways based on biochemical reactions. So they're mechanical, basically. If you look into every single neuron, it's going to act according to the relationship it has with the nearby neurons, chemical processes, etc. So with that in mind, if it's all mechanical all the way down, where is that sort of um, opportunity for, for freedom, for agency within that? And um, I agree with this deterministic model. I think it is mechanical all the way down. Um, so Sam well, would Let me then, stop you there and yeah. say, what, because I think this creates a problem for a lot of people. Yeah. Actually, I don't have a problem with that mm. at all. And I, I, I will say in a second, what yeah. I, in a moment, what I think freedom really is. Yep. Um, but so why, why is that problematic for so many people? So, um, so yeah, the, the argument would go down to, to saying, well, if, let's say we use like an example of two career criminals that, that do horrific acts and um, you could say, well, well, they're evil people, right? And um, in, in one Sam, Sam Harris's blog post, he sort of points out that if he was born with the same genetics as these people and with the exact same upbringing and life experiences, he would have committed the same acts. So he's saying that atom to atom, he would have been the same person. He would have done that himself, given those same initial conditions and life upbringing. So how can we therefore hold someone morally responsible? And he goes a step further and observes that, because he's big into his meditation and anyone that's done meditation for any period of time, does have this sort of profound realization that they're not the author of their own thoughts. So I do not think my thought into being, the mm -hmm. thought sort of comes into my conscious awareness. And um, we can notice other phenomena in our life that sort of exposes the mechanical nature of our brains. So, so where's the, I still don't see the problem yeah. so far. <laughs> it's like, why, why is this, pro have you debated people on this? at all? Um, debated, but yeah, a few friends on this. So, so I, yeah. I actually would argue the counterpoint, right? So I don't believe, I, I do believe there is free will, but just to, to sort of expand on what, what the argument, that argument. So, so it's essentially saying that 
the thoughts come to us, we don't define our thoughts. Mm -hmm. We don't define our purposes. We often find day to day that um, the words coming out of my mouth, I haven't decided what I'm going to say next, right? So it's this theory that actually we, we are, we're sort of witnesses to our lives. We, we sort of watching the video play, but everything that's actually happening is not in our control. It's just sort of preordained, it's mechanical. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, that's the, the essential argument that Sam would have that- And I think that's what and, disturbs people. Yeah. I, I think people hate that idea. They're not, they're not completely in control, but mm -hmm. if you ask someone if they truly feel free, a lot of times they will tell you no. Mm -hmm. because freedom is really a feeling. Mm -hmm. That's really all it is. And so when someone tells us, well, you're not, you don't have free will, you're challenging that feeling of freedom. And for a lot of people, it's really delicate and fragile. So they feel almost attacked just by even saying something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm perfectly okay with it because if I, if I can experience freedom and it, it gives me fulfillment, and then someone comes along and says, well, it's, it's not real, I would just be like, choose your reality, man. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to go do my thing. And as long as I'm not harming myself or other people and I'm not completely delusional, mm -hmm. I will be happy in my freedom. And one example I love to bring up for various reasons, various contexts and various problems is Viktor Frankl, who was put in a concentration camp and he decided that they weren't going to take his freedom away, that he mm -hmm. was still going to maintain his sense of freedom. And that is just like mind blowing to think mm -hmm. that. And because he can do that, I think hopefully never, I'm never in such a situation that that gives me agency to always choose that, that feeling of like, well, no, I'm going to choose my feeling of freedom and say that I always have freedom no matter what else, mm -hmm. whatever else is going on around me. And that makes me feel more resourceful. That makes me feel like I can solve problems and I can go up there and do what I need to do, whatever I can do. But if I believe that I'm not free, and that is a that is the feeling that I get from that belief. Then I'm limited. Then I'm not accessing resources. Then I have trouble solving problems. Mm -hmm. So it's more about for me the feeling and backing up that feeling with okay, what do I have agency over? Mm -hmm. How does that fit with? Yeah, I, I agree with a large amount of what you're saying. So, so my argument against the points that I've laid out so far would be that we our conscious experience plays a part. It it, it so we, we consciously, what, why, do we, why are we conscious? So we're conscious because um, we can pay attention to things, make decisions um, according to our purposes. And this is a really key point. Mm -hmm. So there is a boundedness towards our freedom. Um, I think the best definition of free will really is being able to act in accordance with our purposes. So... And when um, you say purposes, uh, would, would that be a synonym for values? Essentially, yeah. So, um, so we're born with needs. Um, so, you know, we, we, if you use a computational framework of the brain, um, which I like to use, um, a brain can be sort of considered as an algorithm where it's it's based on reward maximization. So, we are attracted to. Um, to needs which give us pleasure and when they're not met we get pain signals and in order to sort of prioritize between those um, different needs we create a hierarchy or a representation of those um, the importance of those needs and um, I know we talked and passed about sort of Maslow's hierarchy and mm. um, I agree with you that I, I don't think it's that static so it's based on self-actualization as, mm. as the top that probably works better in a, in a western yeah. culture versus an eastern culture where they went more based on the collective um, but but really I, I think it's a generalization but the point is that everyone has their individual hierarchy of purposes so I think a lot of people can go their entire lives um, without being consciously aware of what those hierarchy of purposes are and not really questioning them. And I think that the issues that people have and where people struggle as they get older is because they haven't decided and they haven't clearly focused their attention on those hierarchy of purposes, they often contradict and there can be inherent um, frictions within those hierarchy of purposes mm. that causes a lot of pain down the line if you don't sort of address them and fix them. But going back to sort of freedom, I think that the key point is what are we? What, what is our function within the brain? So 
if Sam Harris was right and there is no free will, it would be almost the case that we are, we're just watching a video, you know, we're watching a film of our lives and we're just passive spectators. But it doesn't feel like that. And I don't think it would serve any evolutionary purpose to have that. Why would we have bodies that are just watching a video if we weren't able to actually make decisions within that? I think the role of what consciousness is doing is it is that functionality in the brain that can help make decisions that ally to those purposes. But the key point as well is it, you can actually turn that attention inwards and change the purposes themselves over time. So like Schopenhauer had this, uh, he's got a quote that says, man can want what he wants, but he can't want what he wants. So sorry, he can do what he wants, but he can't want what he wants. Mm. And he's sort of saying there, you can do what you want according to those purposes, but you can't necessarily change the purposes. I would actually extend that to say you can also change your purposes. So the extent of our free will is actually quite broad. It just requires training and it requires awareness and um, a maturity as well. So can you give me an example? Because I have had this argument, when you say purposes, that sounds like values to me and yep. values and NLP are extremely important. Mm -hmm. and. We also do that where, um, and when I do coaching sessions with people, I'll say, okay, what is it you want? Because you know, you're coming to me for mm -hmm. something. You're not just showing up for just to you know have a coaching session. And they'll say, okay, I want to make a million dollars next year, and that's the goal. And I'm not so interested in that yeah. because it, when they understand their values, they might even change the goal. So the goal is just kind of a placeholder mm -hmm. for the moment. Yeah. And so I'll say, well, what is important to you about that? So now I'm eliciting the value, the purpose behind having that money, because green paper or numbers in our bank account are meaningless to us unless there is a purpose for it, right? Mm -hmm. Unless there's a value to it, what can I do with this? Mm -hmm. And speaking of freedom, you know, a lot of people relate money to freedom or freedom to money. And so I'm more interested in those values. And then once I elicit uh, several values from the person, and I, I do an exhaustive elicitation of that and make sure that we pull everything out on the table. And then I do a hierarchy. I want to know in this specific context, what is the hierarchy of those values? And then people come to me and say, uh, I want to, what if I want to change my values? And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, where did you get this from? Where, why would you want to change a value? And they're like, I was listening to Tony Robbins and he said, change your values. And these are the values you should have. And I was like, don't listen to that. <laughs> it's like, it's more important to find out what's in there. What is important to you? Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're valuing something outside of yourself, someone else saying what should be important to you. And that's not a good place to operate from. So you, you want to know what your values are. And if you want to change a value, know that that's another value coming through. That's, there's another purpose behind that. And so get clear what that is. And if what it is is out, external influences, no, don't do that because if you try to fulfill ex values of external influence, you're, you're never going to really experience mm. that fulfillment that we get when we actually do fulfill values. So when you say change purposes, are you changing values in that way or what, what are uh, you meaning by to, that? To an extent, yeah. So I, I think if, if, we, if we don't focus our attention on what our values are and really interrogate them, we'll often find the sort of, we pick up our values like magpies. So a bit of it is internally as a consequence of our personality. So, if, you know, if, if I'm more extrovert and get more energy from people, one of my internal values may be more around uh, social settings, spending time with friends. Mm. And that may be an important value for me or purpose as I go about my life. So genetic factors play a role but also um, the upbringing that you get. So the relationships you have with your friends and the attitudes you pick up from them, from your parents. So if I'm brought up in an academic family uh, that really value um, sort of a, a, a educational achievements, mm. you know, that's probably, I'm just gonna internalize that as you grow up and just gonna take it for granted that that's one of the values I have. And I, I think people, a large part of the values are picked up from the upbringing, both family and friends. Um, and also, you know, the media, the consumer, and everything like that. Um, but also, also the genetics. The problem is that if you just sort of gradually absorb them without really focusing your time to actually address them, what can happen, I think, is a lot of people get older and they realise that those values um, sort of run against each other. Okay, so I think we're agreeing here, okay. actually. Okay, yeah. so so you can find that um, let's say someone that is values attainment, achievement, and getting a really good job, mm -hmm. um, they get the career they want. 
you know, externally they're really happy, but they find that nonetheless they're feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to the fact that they haven't recognised that there's a hierarchy of values that they've been ignoring and suppressing because they haven't mm -hmm. been consciously aware of what they actually are. So, for instance, um, maybe that they're uh, sort of, they're not, or they're neglecting their family or they're neglecting their social relationships they hadn't quite appreciated when they were making those decisions how important family, friends and all mm. those sorts of things are to them. And I, I think this is actually the source of a lot of depression. I, I think that... I agree. I think that it, depression is essentially a, cr a chronically not living with integrity towards your values. So it's, it's a case of mm. not understanding what your actual internal purposes are, not living against them, and then not listening to your subconscious. So your subconscious is communicating to your brain via your emotions and your feelings. And if you suppress them, you're not living in harmony with them. And you, you need to live with them. So, so maybe, yeah, going back to your point of it, can, it doesn't make sense to change your values, perhaps that's not the right way of saying it. Perhaps it's more a case of actually fully understanding what your values are so that you can live in harmony what, with what they are. But, uh, but sometimes you do need to tweak them because you can't have it all sometimes. You can't have that amazing career and um and also spend time with the family so maybe it's a case of augmenting them or well, that's so where that i think the hierarchy comes life. in to place mm -hmm. because yeah you it's hard when you feel that sort of absolute fulfillment it's one of those rare times whenever mm -hmm. you're actually fulfilling multiple very high level values but i also think what you're talking about too is it brings up the discussion of strategy uh, in NLP, it's mm -hmm. maybe slightly different in the philosophical terms that you're used to. So I wouldn't look at a job or a career as a value. Mm -hmm. I would look at that as it's a strategy to fulfill values. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is like most people value success. And you may have been brought up in a household where success was highly valued. So maybe there was some internalization of that. But more importantly, what you probably internalized was how do you go about being successful? Mm -hmm. And let's say you're in a household where it, how uh, you are successful is only determined by money. Mm -hmm. And then you go out there and make a bunch of money and then, yeah, you're depressed and you feel mm -hmm. empty inside. Well, you still value success. It's just that you had a, an, a, you had a criteria that doesn't work for you or a strategy that mm -hmm. doesn't work for you. And what unfortunately happens is a lot of people stop there and they just get depressed and they don't have another strategy or they don't have another criteria and they don't do enough soul searching or they're not willing to experiment and explore enough to find out what does it for me. They're just, yeah. they feel burnt on success and they go, okay, well, it's not attainable for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I can make the money, but that kind of success is, I, I just want to be happy instead. And it's like, mm -hmm. I would come back and say, well, well, no, you still want to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's just that the way that you were defining it and the way that you were pursuing it, the strategy you were using didn't work for you. It can work for some people, but it wasn't yours. That's the internalization. Mm -hmm. How does that fit with yeah, I, I think it's right. And as you're saying, I'm just thinking back to the, the free will discussion as to you're sort of saying then that those underlying purposes can never change. It's just you come up with a strategy to better align them. I hate, <laughs> I hate to say that they can never change. Yeah. And people have asked me this question and as many, so I've done, I've elicited my own values over and over again and I've done the hierarchy over and over again. And people are like, well, why do you keep doing it? Don't you know what they are? And I say, yes, but every three to six months, I'm collecting da you know, enough data to go and revisit those values and say, well, what's really doing it for me? And in fact, you can even apply the 80-20 rule. You know, what is getting you 20? What is the 20% that's getting mm -hmm. you 80% of the fulfillment of that value? And then the next question is, is do, you ever, do they ever change? I don't think so. I think I gain more clarity about mm -hmm. them, but like, I'll give you my top three values that keep showing up in every context of my life is joy, passion, and freedom. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really change. If I have joy, passion, and freedom in almost any area of my life, I'm really fulfilled. Mm -hmm. The strategies change, the goals change, criteria might even change a little bit. Yeah. Those values don't seem to change for me. And I suppose that, that exercise of actually clarifying the actual essential source of what those values are rather than like you said like the the things but the, those extra steps that actually aren't the value itself but are more just a, a vague thought as to how you can get to it so like strategy you said, yeah like money it may not actually be money it may be more a feeling of um 
being worth something or uh, pleasing your family or too. you know yeah, th those yeah. sorts of things but it's often it's like getting to the source of what that value actually right. is is it because it broadens then your options so yes. you're saying like actually if you get to the essence of what that value is you've got so much more choice than if exactly. you higher up the chain exactly and, and it's amazing sometimes whenever somebody comes to me with a goal that they're fixated on and it's really causing them a lot of problems because they think this is the only way mm. And then they don't, they have no idea what their values actually are. They're just so fixated on that milestone. Mm. And once I get them to the values, then they experience a, a sense of freedom and they realize that that was just one way. And yes, mm. the options and the choices start to come about. And that's what an NLP is a, a big part of it is it's not all about like the, the goal is not necessarily freedom. It's freedom if you want freedom. Mm. We do say, though, that we want to add more choice. So we're working, in the, I guess this is a theoretical part of NLP, is that we don't function directly from reality, like objective reality. Mm -hmm. We build a model in our mind mm -hmm. or a map in our mind of reality because we can't access all yeah. of reality. And so we have this mo uh, map or this model, and what's important about it is to have lots of choice in it. And when you, have, when you perceive it as having less choice, then suffering happens. It's also you want a lot of uh, resources to access within that map and you want, it needs to be accurate enough. So those mm -hmm. are the three criteria of having a, a successful map of reality. It's mm -hmm. cho having choice, having more choices, uh, having, res having access to resources, and it needs to be at least somewhat accurate so you're not like delusional or detached from reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of what you said chimes with a lot of what the latest philosophy says around what you know consciousness, what the self is. Mm -hmm. You absolutely make the, the valid point that we do not have access to reality. We're mm -hmm. sort of nested within a, a simulation of reality that our brains created. And when you realize that um, what we can consciously do, then everything we see is a representation. It's not the actual reality. So mm -hmm. you can manipulate a lot within that. So I think, again, going back to that free will, thing is if you actually realize the extent to which we can manipulate our own little universe in our head um, it, it's not a real thing it is just a story that we tell ourselves our lives there's way more agency than I think um, certainly Sam Harris would say I think we've got a lot of free will over a lot of our lives and a lot of our happiness and um, and our emotions and our feelings and things like that so I think that should be very empowering um, but, but just going back to I think I think where we are then is in terms of determinism and does that contradict free will. I think what we, the boundedness of free will really is, is like you said, we, we can't really alter our core purposes. That is really where determinism it, it has this sort of strength in that it's def the, our genetics, our life upbringing is sort mm. of solidifying our overall values. What free will itself is, is our ability to make decisions to achieve those purposes. So our free will gives us that ability to, it's in our control to, to reach our goals, reach our happiness. Mm. So I would contend that the opposite of free will is, is not determinism, but it's compulsion. So, mm. um, and, and that really is, you know, we all know that sensation day to day of, well, if we started the day and did our to-do list of what we wanted to achieve, um, how often do we actually do that? We'll often find throughout the day that, you know, we're trying to eat healthy, but we get that dessert from, um, on top of the salad or we'll intend to go to the gym five days a week and we only go for three days a week and that's we're acting not the contrary to our purposes so if we define again free will as acting in a way that supports our purposes these are day-to-day -day constant blockers that are stopping us from actually doing that we're submitting to impulses in our brain there's like a, a lack of integrity with what we actually want to do and I think that's the real enemy of free will um, and that's something that I think in LNLP you do a lot, isn't it? It's around how you can conquer um, your own internal impulses to better actually get, you know, to, it, to actually exercise free will. And I would even say in some cases create impulses mm. that yeah. naturally sort of put you on autopilot to move mm. toward what it is you want. I, so I want to kind of turn this thing all the way upside down and throw this one at you and see how you respond to it. Because I think we're, in, we're agreeing entirely too much. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need some more drama here. The idea of whether or not we have free will and the way you were describing it is like, well, we're kind of just watching a video or, and we don't really have agency over it or, or do we have agency over it? I think the question is kind of the wrong question because it implies that there is sort of a separate self who either has free will or doesn't have free will. 
and I don't believe that there's a separate self. Mm -hmm. There's only a concept of self and <clears throat> all of it is connected. All of it, and this kind of actually plays to what you were saying is like you believe like, yes, we have free will because we do have agency and sort of engagement. The conscious mind is engaging, the unconscious mm -hmm. is engaging and they're actually engaging together and sometimes they're bumping mm -hmm. up against each other, but it's all one entity. It's all yeah. one sort of reality. It's all one neurology. Mm -hmm you, you know, in a objective reality are sitting here next to me, but I don't know that actually to be true. Mm -hmm. You are sitting in my subjective reality with my electrical impulses from my neurology signaling that you're sitting here. So in a sense, I, there is no separation between you and me because I'm only interacting with my neurology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I agree with a lot of what you said there. I think if we come down to that definitely, so when I'm talking about you have free will. I'm not actually necessarily referencing the self. So what I'm more referencing is, is what I am at my core is conscious awareness. So I'm a, I'm a functional part of my brain that is consciously aware. Um, it's not consciously aware of reality. It's consciously aware of the representations my brain is showing me. So, so perhaps of a, of a step back and just explain a bit around this computational framework of sort of the mind and the brain. Um, the basic idea is a, a neuron is not conscious, right? A, a neuron is purely, purely mechanical and we are an aggregation of neurons that are all mechanical or inacting in a mechanical way, but nonetheless we're conscious. So what actually is, what, 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 what is consciousness? What, what does that actually mean? I think what's happening is our brain is creating a simulation of the world, um, similar to how um, you know the hardware in a computer is capable of creating a software mm -hmm. um, simulation. It's very similar. So it's creating a software simulation and it's creating a first person character in that brain. So that first person character in the brain is what we would um, define as the self. So it's got an autobiographical memory. Um, it has it created a story of what it is. Wow. But that is not what you actually are. So, you know, Buddhists that enter, you know, very deep meditation states, I think, you know, it, it, it's very similar to this, this concept of enlightenment, is realizing that you, the self is, is just a character. That bleeding of that people get in psychedelics of feeling they're one with the world is that sensation that you are not the self, you're actually the simulator itself. Your mind is generating everything you see. Mm. Um, you're not just the, the, the first person looking out. So, so when I'm talking about you, I'm really talking about conscious awareness. We're a specific functional aspect of our minds that has the responsibility to pay attention to things. So if we can pay attention externally um, and make decisions out in the world, we can actually turn that attention inwards. And actually, um, I think that's where you can get a lot of the um, a lot of great values in reconstructing, reconstructing the brain. So reconstructing our subconscious, understanding our subconscious drivers, and actually by turning our conscious attention inwards, we can reprogram it to better service. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, the central point is the self is a construct. It is just a story yeah. that the brain creates. And this is why, you know, like when people say, oh, NLP, uh, it's pseudoscience, it just drives me nuts because it's like, first of all, it's not a science. It's not trying to play itself off <laughs> yeah. as a science. It's merely saying what you just said, that we have these subjective constructs. What, it, what are we truly and never be able to define? You know, you could go on and on about it, but at the same time, we're inside the jar, not outside the mm -hmm. jar. So we only have one sort of perspective of it, but we use the self as a way, as a construct to sort of function in that simulation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you can become aware of that, then you can change it. So you actually can change yourself, I think is what you're referring to as looking inward. Yep. And then as a way of changing internally, you can actually sort of give yourself the, the sensation that the reality has changed. Mm -hmm. So what I do is a model that's called the self-concept model. And through understanding basically what we're talking about and the structure of it, you can change it. And then that's what we call a transformation. And what I've talked about a lot is every time I would have one of these transformations, it would feel like my, the external reality would change too. And a lot of people think of it that way, but it's like, well, that's not really what happened. What really happened is I changed. And therefore, because I am not separate from my reality, my reality appears to have changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 
Yeah, I mean, I mentioned to you before around the sort of Keegan's five stage model, because I think this really provides a gateway path to really expanding the freedom that we have as that conscious agent bit over our whole minds. Mm. Um, so it, it essentially uses this subject object uh, formulation. So uh, as we develop from children to adulthood, we essentially move from being the subject of our experiences to to treating uh, to a being able to objectify them so rather than feeling like we're embedded and we are that experience we realize that they're just aspects of our mind that we can manipulate and shift and change if we want mm. and that's part of essentially broadening our conscious control over our our minds itself and increasing our freedom and that's actually what um, i would call freedom that mm. ability to sort of start to understand the mechanism to start mm. to understand the subjectivity and how it's mm. being created how it's structured and then the agency to be able to change that structure. So therefore you change yourself and you change your reality. I mean, what could be more freedom than mm. that? Yeah. And it sort of you know, brings me back to what we discussed before the podcast started around that famous picture of the Buddhist monk that, um, who it sets fire to himself and remains a perfectly composed meditative stance throughout the whole experience of being burned alive. Mm. So this man has managed to transcend all emotions, all feelings, mm. um, even though it's, it would be horrific pain to most people, he has managed to gain the freedom completely over his mind to the extent that pain does not have any effect on him. So that to me is ultimate freedom, uh, ultimate free will. I wouldn't recommend that you yeah, do that. Yeah, I say, but, don't, don't try that um, at home. <laughs> but it essentially means that anything that happens in your life, you have the freedom to interpret it and do with it what you want. You're mm -hmm. completely insulated from pain from any negatives that you want. It's probably not, you don't wanna hack the brain so much because actually pain signals are useful and you still want to achieve purposes in your life. But I think it shows the extent to which if we, you know, if, if we really train our brains enough, it's possible. Mm. Mm. So uh, what are some, or let me just ask, uh, I guess maybe asking your per, you and your personal experience, understanding freedom. You know, if you think about, well, I guess, how long have you been embarking on this understanding of freedom? How many years? Um, I suppose uh, a number of years. It's 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 not my it's not my main sort of philosophical mm. philosophical sort of uh, main interest. But no, I've, I've definitely pondered um, agency is important to me. I suppose yeah. Let, let me answer it by saying that uh, the concept of understanding what's in my control and what's not, and really trying to maximise what is in my control, I think is really important. I think as a life tool having high agency, I think all the studies show that you're disproportionately going to be more happy, more successful mm. and everything like that. So from a practical basis, the, the, the limits of freedom of agency, um, yeah, I've been interested in for most of my life. How much or how has embarking on that journey of understanding freedom, how has that changed your life or how has that affected your life? And I know that's not the easiest thing because it's hard to know exactly know what you know, cause it, especially coming from a philosophical uh, way of thinking about it. But is there, can you explain um, that? Yeah, I think it's benefited me in my career because um, I recognize that I am responsible for my own success. So, you know, you've got to have bravery, you've got to actually get up and out and do that. I think that requires um, a realization that you're in control of your life. You have the freedom to decide what you're going to do next, not anyone else. Um, I think people that can get into this mindset that they're sort of spectators uh, can create a sort of nihilistic, pointless existence sort of attitude mm. that doesn't serve anyone because you, you can control the bits that you can control. Um, so then that, that's uh, one aspect to it. Um, no, I've, yeah. I've, uh, have you read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? No, I haven't. Oh, you it? should definitely check it out. Okay. It's great. Uh, that guy, the writer of the book, it's very autobiographical even though mm -hmm. it's considered a novel he goes down that rabbit hole and becomes very nihilistic. Mm -hmm. And not that he, you know, he didn't turn to a life of crime or anything like that, but he actually just really started to detach from like his own reality. And I've heard that before and I've actually experienced it to an extent of sort of, if you go far enough and, and I'm calling out Zen, but it, you can do this in other disciplines as well. It does become very nihilistic and mm -hmm. you get to this point where you could go, well, okay, nothing has meaning. And then if you get to that point, what was the purpose of that? You know, it's yeah. just to, to say that you mastered meaning or it just, it's so uh, deconstructionist or, or regressive. It mm -hmm. just, that's not 
what we want to what we want to do. I, and that's why I say like, well, freedom to me is just it's that feeling. And how do mm -hmm. I create that feeling? Because I know when I feel freedom, I I feel happier, and mm -hmm. it gives me access to uh, a lot of the other values that I want to experience. Mm -hmm. And then more choice. And so if it's all an illusion, I'm okay with that. I'm not mm -hmm. hurting anyone. I'm not hurting myself. Yep. And actually, I'm doing just the opposite. I'm creating yeah, a yeah. better life. But there is that dark nihilistic side if you go down that route. There isn't. And it doesn't serve you. Know, it comes back to if you, if you intellectually absorb that way of seeing the world, you're probably not going to be focused on achieving your purposes. And if you're not focused on achieving your purposes, you are not going to be happy. So if you, do you want to be depressed in this life? Do you want to, you know, have all these negative emotions on a daily basis? Probably not. So if, if you don't want to, yeah, it just doesn't serve you. So I'd say, like, choose a philosophy that actually serves you, that's practical, that, that, that enables you to achieve that happiness. Because ultimately, yeah, maybe there is no meaning outside of the meaning that we give things. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there's no meaning. There's still meaning to me, right? Um, you could make the argument that objectively there is no meaning. Mm -hmm. But again, what purpose or meaning are you trying mm, to yeah. derive from that? Yeah, yeah, it's meaning according to what, right? right. It's from what perspective? So just because something means something to me, there is meaning. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that, that to me would uh, be self-definitive. Self um, so, so yeah. Yeah, and we're meaning-making machines. It's we. Everything we do has a value behind it. It has an intention behind it. So there's no real getting around it. There's more just uh, such extreme detachment that, you know, trying to give yourself a feeling that nothing matters or nothing has mm. meaning. It's just so self-defeating. Yeah. And it, just going back to what you asked me before around sort of how, how has it served me? Like, I think we touched on before around sort of stoic philosophy because I think the concept there, again, is freedom almost from your own feelings and thoughts in terms of being able to better manipulate and control how you react to situations. I think mm. it's an incredibly powerful tool. It can mm. build resiliency. Um, being able to rewrite the story of, of situations um, really gives you control over the story of your life. And again, that, that control is more freedom to, mm. to, to act as you want. You brought that word up a lot, story, not just here, but in mm. previous conversations. What is, uh, let's see how I can ask this question. What is the difference to you between a generalization and a story? Um, so I'll often notice that my interpretation or my, the emotions I attach to an event is due to my interpretation of the event and that, so I can trace it to a story that I'm telling myself about the situation so you know it could be in my life if I um, if, if I have an argument with my partner or a friend um, and I'm feeling really annoyed and let down I think I'll often trace well why am I feeling this emotion and I can trace it back to a story I'm telling so that the fact of this way means that they don't appreciate me or they're, um, they're not um, you know, that they're, they're disrespectful, um, they are rude, and why am I putting up with this situation? You know, there's all these sub-narratives associated mm. with that emotion. And if you actually tweak the story itself, if you realise, wait a minute, is that story correct? Mm. Maybe not. Maybe actually that I'm, I'm just telling the wrong story here, and if I update the story, I don't even need to address the emotion. I just need to look at the story, change the story, and then the emotion magically goes away. And I think understanding that process that the the emotion comes downstream from the story, mm -hmm. um, changing the story can change the emotion from then on. I'm going to ask the same question, but in a different way. Because <laughs> sometimes people think of generalization as uh, something different. Um, but I guess you didn't really say what the difference was between that and generalization, but I still want to ask the mm -hmm. question differently. What's the difference between a story and a belief? Um, I think... Or is there a, a difference? Yeah, I'm, the I'm not sure if there is too much difference. I think a belief is explained through a story. I, I suppose a, a belief is a type of story, but there can be other stories other than a belief. Um, but uh, most, yeah, a belief is basically a story you've told yourself about the situation that you believe to be true. Okay, because um, the way you were using stories sounds so mm -hmm. much uh, like how I would use and teach creating a generalization, transforming a generalization. Mm -hmm. And when I say generalization, I'm using that interchangeably with belief. They're synonymous okay. to me. So it's, you have a set of experiences and then you make a meaning around those mm -hmm. set of experiences. When you say story, my mind kind of reverts to a three act structure with, you know, that kind of narrative. 
um, which actually isn't all that different because part of the structure of a belief is time mm -hmm. and time being one of two dimensions that we experience reality, time and mm -hmm. space. So I guess I see it like a story as a beginning and a middle and an end. And, you know, there's a, uh, the point of, I guess, a transformation, whether it's a tragedy or mm -hmm. a hero's journey. Um, but I don't like when you're using story, I don't think the hero's journey applies to the way that you're using story every time you say story. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think there's a lot of overlap. Perhaps it, it, it does come down to semantics. Um, I suppose, yeah, I would, I would use story because, you know, even a, a belief, name any belief that you could have, like, I believe in, in God, I, I would say that you can reinterpret that as a story that you're telling about your world and the place in it. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe it's just down to semantics, but I think the key is it's um, you're attaching some form of narrative to a situation that's mm -hmm. not just the situation itself. So like, you know, if I look at a chair, I'm not just seeing the chair, I'm building an internal narrative as to what that chair is and attaching meaning to it by saying that it's something that you sit on. It's mm -hmm. something that, um, you know, uh, has a certain qualities of beauty that I like. That they, they I, I would describe them through narratives or stories, but yeah, perhaps they probably map quite well to generalizations as well. Yeah, because I mean, if you say, okay, that's a chair and people sit on it, and that's the meaning you're making of it. To me, that would be a belief, not necessarily a story, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, if you call it a story. It's, yeah, it sounds like there's quite a lot of overlap, doesn't it? So yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's fine. Interesting. All right. Well, I think we fleshed this out pretty well, and I, I, I was, uh, I was actually hoping for a little more disagreement. It, it seems. Like well, we'll have to, uh, <laughs> we'll have to come a bit more combative next time. I'm yeah. sure if we, uh, if we keep exploring it, there yeah. will probably be some uh, mm -hmm. at some point. There was, there will be like some impasse. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add to? Uh, what you were no, I don't think so. Just yeah, I'm going to be writing this blog post. So I'll share it with you when it's done. But um, great, yeah. and well, I would tell people where they could find you, but they can't find you yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, but hopefully soon you'll yeah. have uh, a blog going. Yeah, I'm hoping next week or so. So I'll, I'll send it over to you and perhaps it's before this is published. Oh, uh, yeah. And yeah. then we'll put it in the description. Also, uh, if you'd like a guide or a summarization of this conversation, check the description. We'll put a link in there uh, for you to access that if you want, want to just do a, a, a reading of this. And uh, when you do maybe have a YouTube channel and mm -hmm. the blog and all that, uh, we can still drop that into the description. So if you're watching this much later, still check the description. You might be able to find Matt there. I keep encouraging him to do that. <laughs> yeah, one day. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for joining me on this. It's been a really interesting discussion. I, I figured uh, out of all those discussions that we've had on philosophy and not just philosophy, uh, kind of the, the I, I like the way that your approach to philosophy is, is very practical and mm -hmm. you don't get lost in the, the sky and everything. And I thought this would make a, a good conversation to put out there in a, in a podcast. So thank you for joining Definitely. me. No, thanks very much. All right.